Hey guys, here we have two of the hottest new mid-size premium SUVs. From Jaguar we've got the F-Pace SVR and BMW with the new X3M. These are hardcore models in the, in the mid-size market. So we're talking about direct rivals like the Mercedes GLC 63 AMG as well as the Alfa Romeo Stelvio QV or Quadrifoglio, however you pronounce it, um, in the hardcore department. There's also the Audi SQ5 to some degree, although it's not quite as serious as these two models. They might compete in the same segment and they're about the same size, um, but they definitely have very distinct personalities. So the Jag is actually the most powerful SUV in this class. It features a five litre supercharged V8 producing 405 kilowatts or 404 kilowatts depending on what spec sheet you're reading. That's the highest output of any car in this segment. Over in the BMW, it's quite an interesting engine. It's a brand new BMW M engine. Uh, so that's not the same as BMW's own engines. Uh, this is built in-house by BMW M. And it's the evolution of the current or outgoing M3 S55 engine. It's called S58 and it will actually feature in the upcoming M3 that's not even out yet. It's still a three litre twin turbocharged straight six um, and it produces 375 kilowatts in the case of this competition version. Overseas, I think it produces 353 kilowatts in the base model X3M, uh, but in Australia, we can only, we're only offered the, the competition. Being the competition model, uh, it's pretty easy to spot. Uh, it's got the black details, like the black grille at the front, black side mirrors, um, some more black grills there, which are actually fake, that annoys me quite a bit. Um, and then around at the back, or blue, black roof rails, and then around at the back, you've got black exhaust tips as well. And of course, the badge that says, clearly competition. In terms of design alone, the F-Pace definitely stands out in my opinion. It looks much more extravagant, elegant, sexy even. Um, it's got this pouncing front end, actual bonnet vents that go through to the engine bay. Um, yeah, it definitely stands out more on the road. Whereas the X3 looks kind of conventional, it's a bit more upright as well. You can actually see the, uh, the, the height of the windscreen there is a bit more than the Jag. The Jag's got like steeper, uh, or what do you call it, more angled uh, A-pillars there. So they're a bit more sports car like, whereas the X3, they sort of rise up more like a conventional four wheel drive or SUV wagon. That does mean there's some differences inside as well in terms of practicality. Um, but we'll check out the interiors in a minute. At first I thought the SVR was just a, an F-Pace with a V8, but it's actually quite different. So you've got this sort of vent style thing here, which is the fake vent at the bottom, um, but it sort of shows an extra bit of width there on the back, whereas the normal F-Pace just wraps cleanly around. It looks really, really fat from the rear. It's uh, very chunky and it looks very aggressive, especially with these quad exhaust pipes just poking out there. I love these little fins at the bottom as well. They sort of guide the air away from the uh, underneath the car. And there's also matching ones at the front there. There is a real vent going through the, uh, the front guard, which is nice to see. And of course, some real vents up in the wheel arches there that uh, capture air that's going in the front. Over on the BMW, I've noticed it's got a, uh, a horizontal cooler at the bottom there, which is like a, uh, a racing car. Some of the racing cars, they scoop air up and then feed them through a, a cooler that's actually horizontal like that. So that's pretty cool, I think. And then in the side, you've got more coolers, uh, intakes, big intakes that uh, feed through to the inner front wheel arch. Let's jump inside and have a look at the differences there. I won't start them up just yet. We'll just look at the, uh, just in terms of the space. So these are SUVs, uh, which means they're pitched as, you know, somewhat practical family cars that uh, just happen to be powered by enormous engines. For me, the F-Pace has always been a more sporty uh, SUV. This pillar sort of comes spearing towards your, your head way more than it does in many of the other mid-size SUVs, but it does provide that sporty look on the outside. And once you're in, it's definitely a, a nice, natural driving position, fully adjustable. We've got an electric steering column on this model, um, electric seat as well. It does have uh, electric lumbar support, but it doesn't have, from what I can see, doesn't have the side bolsters that are adjustable that sort of hug you in. 
like they do in some cars. I think that's got it as well. It could be an option. Knowing Jaguar, there are quite a few options with their vehicles. Like the exterior, it is very elegantly designed, um, sort of polished chrome or polished metal detailing around pretty much everywhere. Nice piano black. Um, it does scratch pretty easily. I've noticed like this around the gear, gear selector here, it's got some scratches and stuff already. Um, but yeah, it's very calm and sort of a bit subtle. And it's got that sort of uh, sinister style to it. A couple of cup holders for, for practicality. You've got a little, another little shelf down here, which you can hide your keys or your phone or something. And then a little mobile phone pad. It's not a wireless charging pad, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, perhaps that's you know, giving, giving us some indication of the F-Pace's age. Not that it's old, but it is, it's, it, it's getting on now a little bit. It needs a, a sort of major update. You've got a bit more space in the center console there and then of course a glove box the seats are really nice they're kind of uh well look at them they look like racing bucket seats i like the actual red detailing i know it's it's a bit off-putting at first but um maybe because i'm getting in, in and out of cars all the time i get sick of just boring black um and i like the sort of excitement of these if it was all red that would probably be a bit ghastly but just with a bit of red detailing around the sides there it, it reminds you that you're not in a conventional mid-size premium suv you're in something a bit special you can of course change this to different colors and so on when you're going through the uh the order books but yeah in terms of space um i feel like i am sitting up a bit higher than i am in the uh the x3 in terms of just on the actual seat my head position might actually be lower if you just measured it from the ground but it feels like you get that perception that you're sitting a bit higher I think that's got to do with the sort of lower profile A pillar there and the lower lower ceiling. There's not much detailing going on on the dash. You've got just a rectangular touch screen there and then a fully digital instrument cluster, which is just a flat screen. There's no sort of, I don't know, this plastic stuff around the, the sides here doesn't feel or look that good either. There's no sort of theater to it. You do have a bit of red stitching up here for the instrument cluster hood though. Nice steering wheel. I actually like this steering wheel more than I do in the one in the uh, the X3. We'll go and have a look at that in a minute. Um, just the way that it's it's not too thick. That one, the one in the X3 is very very thick, um, whereas this is just a nice thickness. And the paddles are right there. Let's check out the back seats. I'll sit on the uh, the driver's side here because I've got the seat in my position. That way we can compare it against the uh, X3, which the seat's also in my position. If you're after an SUV because you want something that's very perched up off the ground. Um, the F-Pace is not really like that because as you can see this roof line I actually have to put my head down to get in um, but you still got to lift your leg up so it does it is off the you know you got the ground clearance there but you just have this lower roof but once you're in um, it's actually pretty pretty spacious for this class I've got plenty of leg room there um, cup holders and the headroom isn't too bad it's not touching the camera which is on top of my head but it would be a little bit close but yeah the headroom is totally fine for me um, I'm about 170 centimeters and yeah there's decent space here there is no bottle holder in the uh, the door pocket here which is a little bit disappointing I mean you could put a bottle in there I'm sure and it probably wouldn't fall out too easily especially this back bit um, but it's not really sculpted to uh, to take a bottle a little bit more red uh, leather detailing around the the door trim there and then it's sort of it's not carbon fiber it's just patterned um, uh, hard plastic or something um, kind of looks like carbon fiber but it does match these sort of polished stainless steel style uh, trimmings there this one does come with heated rear seats and it's got a, a trio of usb ports sorry two usb ports and a 12 volt socket no climate control there though it's just got a fan on and off and then you can change the direction of the uh the climate but overall you could definitely use this as a family car even the center seat is not too bad the transmission tunnel there is pretty thick as they usually are on these beefy high performance cars um, but it's not too bad my legs aren't quite touching that center console um, the seat is pretty hard as they usually are the backrest in particular um, but yeah totally fine for a uh, for a mid-size SUV category car anyway we'll check out the boot and then we'll head over to the x3 electric tailgate on both of these and you've got a rear seat you can just flick these and the rear seats go down from the from the side there 
You've also got a 12 volt socket in the wall. Good sized boots, definitely enough for the uh, family shopping or a weekend away or something like that. And definitely more than a mid-sized sports sedan. Let's go and check out the X3. So this one's got this sort of peanut butter, uh, two-tone black and peanut butter cream trim, which again, I don't mind it. I, I, I probably wouldn't pick this particular color, but I don't mind a bit of style and a bit of pizzazz with interiors, particularly with uh, high performance cars. Got a little badge there, M Competition, to remind you that it is the competition version. And these are actually illuminated, the little badges there on the seats, like you get in the uh, M4 competition, M3 competition, uh, M5 competition, all the rest of the, uh, the other models. They have these that are illuminated. Before I get in, it feels like that's a much taller ceiling there, or a much taller roof. Um, and I can just swing straight in without crouching down. Also, straight away, that A pillar is further forward and right out of my, uh, uh, you know, there's no chance of my head hitting that. Well, not no chance, but very a smaller chance of hitting it compared with the F pace. Typical BMW design inside, uh, it's kind of got this sort of hexagonal shape that wraps around everything, then a wide screen up the top. Um, standard wireless phone charging on the, the front of the center console there, uh, twin cup holders as well, and then this one's got some carbon fiber detailing. A new gear selector uh, for BMW, uh, even for BMW M, I haven't seen that before. Maybe on the M5, I haven't driven the new M5, um, but it's certainly not on the current X3 or the, the current uh, M3. It's a little bit funny to get used to, but there is a park button, which is good, because uh, some of the previous model M3s, there was no park button. You'd have to put it into neutral. You're a bit sort of worried, is it going to roll away, or is it properly, you know, it's not going to fall into gear, whereas at least there is an actual park button. And then you've got BMW's iDrive system for the uh, multimedia display up the top there. I do like these hand controllers much more than I do the touch screens. Um, in Australia, it's illegal to use your phone um, as you're driving along. But to me, uh, a touchscreen is exactly the same as using your phone. You're still very distracted, invested in, you know, playing around with the screen. Whereas at least with these hand controllers, like on the um, uh, everything from a Mazda, Audi, Mercedes-Benz and BMW, um, you can get used to it once you're familiar with the car and you don't even need to look across to the screen really. You can sort of just glance across quickly and use your hand down here to uh, toggle through the menus. The driving position is, is very good as well, very uh, similar to the, the F-Pace um, in terms of just your, your natural, where your arms rest and where your shoulders sit and everything like that. Even the pedal placement is quite nice. Um, you can do left foot braking if you prefer pretty easily it's, and you've still got space left over for uh, your foot to go on the footrest or down below to the side there. It does feel like I'm sitting a little bit lower in this car, even though, as I said, my head height from the ground is probably a bit higher. It feels like I'm a bit more submerged in the car, and I think that's because the ceiling is a bit higher, or at least it feels like it is a bit higher. These pillars, as I said, are a bit more upright, and it pushes the ceiling a bit higher. And even if it is just perception, it feels like you've got a bit more space and a bit more sort of room to move. You've also got a big center console box there, and a uh, glove box. And of course, BMW's massive uh, bottle holders in the doors. Look how big that is. And there's another big pocket on the side there. Nice detailing around the, the door trims, a bit of carbon fibre, um, and then the traditional X symbol, which is on all the latest uh, X model SUV BMWs, and some contrast stitching as well. We'll check out the back. Yeah, so before even getting in, uh, that ceiling or the roof there does seem a lot higher. I don't need to sort of bend down. It might even be a little bit wider as well, uh, making it a bit easier to get in and out of. Similar amount of leg room as the, uh, the F-Pace. Um, but yeah, it feels like I've got heaps more headroom with a, with a very tall ceiling. It might be just the perception of space, um, but I think this cabin is, you know, it's got a taller orientation. A um, bit more conventional, a bit more wagon-like, definitely a little bit more boring compared with the, the swooping F-Pace, um, but I think you do get a bit more room and a bit more sort of sense of airiness and uh, practicality. And then you've got another uh, bottle holder in the door, huge one there, and a pocket behind. More detailing on the, on the rear door, and it's actually got pop-up blinds as well. 
This one comes with climate control on the back with actual, actual temperature control, which I think is standard. Um, I've personally got a GO1 uh, X330D and even that's got it as standard. I did an option for it. So I'm guessing it would be standard on this. Um, but it's also got heated rear, uh, the side seats are heated, but it doesn't have fan control, um, but it does have the sort of vent control there. Down below, you've just got a single 12 volt socket, which is a little bit disappointing uh, considering the F-Pace has got the two USB ports and a 12 volt socket. You probably can get it as an option. Flip down armrest as well, perfectly positioned um, with some cup holders in there as well. In the middle seat, it, uh, yeah, it's kind of the same. Um, but again, I think I've got that higher sense of spaciousness just because the roof is a bit higher um, and it feels like, you know, if I wanted to wave my arms around for whatever reason, it just feels like I can do it more so than I can in the F-Pace. The seat back is still pretty firm as they, as they usually are, um, but that center console, even the way it sort of wraps around out of your way, it just has that perception that it's got more space in here, even though it might only be marginal. There's no pockets in the backs of the seats, even though they're sports seats, just like the F-Pace, um, but that had little pockets in the back, whereas this doesn't. So it's a little bit disappointing um, if you use those. Um, but yeah, this has got a big panoramic roof as well, which gives you even more headroom. But my head is my yeah, my head's nowhere near the touching the ceiling at all. We'll check out the boot. Electric tailgate as well, they're very slow to operate like they all are. Um, Similar size boot, I'll flash up the specs now, um, but yeah, it just looks pretty similar to me. Um, it does seem a little bit lower, if anything, but again, it's all, all probably got to do with the perception, the way the uh, the, art, the pillars there are all shaped and everything. It's very sort of open and, and square in this, whereas that's definitely more lower profile. It's got a 12 volt socket in the back as well, and you can flip down the seats from here. And I've also noticed it's got a little switch here we can which you can do it from here as well which is nice let's go for a drive and uh, see how they perform on the road see how they handle how comfortable they are and if they still work as suvs and how close they come to being sort of sports cars we'll start off of course with a performance test we'll get the v-box out and we'll compare the differences okay so i've got the v-box clipped on the outside there um, i like to put it on the outside because it seems to get better reception to the gps and i've also got the race logic app uh, it only works with iPhones or, or Apple products. Um, I've got the car all typed in. All I need to do is push start. But before we do that, we're just going to set up the car to make sure it, uh, it engages launch control. Mainly, you have to have the engine in Sport Plus. So the little symbol there on the left-hand side, Sport Plus. And in the transmission on the top here, you've got uh, these little three little symbols there. You make sure you put that into the maximum. Um, and then you put it across into manual mode. It will change gear by itself, upshift by itself, when you're in launch control. Um, I read the manual and it says it will upshift by itself so long as the little checkered flag is there. Um, but you'll see that pop up in a second. You can have it in uh, Sport Plus for the suspension and steering if you want to. It doesn't make any difference to the car's performance. Um, we've had a few comments over the years of people saying, oh, why didn't you have it in Sport for the steering? It doesn't do anything. All it does is change the weight, so the feeling of the steering. Um, I just, personal preference, I like it in the comfort setting. It's, it's not too light, but it's got a bit of weight there. Um, you put it into Sport Plus, it becomes quite, quite heavy. Um, it's just not my cup of tea, it's simple as that. But it doesn't actually change the, the performance of the car. And then the other thing you have to do is disengage the stability control or traction control. So you just hold down this button till a little symbol comes up there, DSC deactivated, and then we're ready to go. We'll just hit go on the app, hard on the brakes, and then full throttle all the way to the floor. Launch control active, wait a second. And that's 100. Just go into details, uh, 0 to 100 in 4.21 seconds. I think that's pretty much bang on with uh, what BMW says it does, uh, which is pretty good. We'll give it one more run and uh, see if we can get any better, but I don't think it will change much. Uh, 
Oh, and by the way, I'm using this telegraph pole here as sort of like our start line. So when I do the jag, um, I'll line it up at the exact same position. It is slightly downhill, very, very, very slightly. It's probably like a meter difference, um, but the surface isn't the best here. Uh, so maybe that's, you know, offsetting any sort of traction issues that, that we might have. But as you just saw, it doesn't have any traction issues whatsoever. Let's give it a go again. Hit start. Make sure we're in the S mode for the transmission. So there's D and S, um, but S is pretty much manual mode as far as I can tell when you've got it in Sport Plus anyway. Um, but that's ready to go. Try again. Hard on the brakes, full throttle. Let it build up a bit. That felt a little bit quicker. Let's have a look. Details, zero to 100 in four seconds flat that time. So four, zero, zero. Hopefully you can see that, but uh, that's pretty good. That time I did hold the brakes, uh, build the revs right up on the brake. Um, it might've been able to build the boost a bit better uh, than the first time I did it. But yeah, there you go, 4.00 seconds. That's pretty darn quick for a midsize SUV. Okay, over in the Jag now. Um, we have actually done the performance testing for this car. Uh, we picked this up a few days before the X3 um, and we've done all the performance testing with the video and uh, all the photos and so on. Um, so I do have a, a sort of benchmark time with the V-Box. Um, the reason I'm saying this is because it's a bit of an excuse because uh, I've noticed the temperature has climbed up, climbed up a bit from the, uh, from the X3. So it's 29 degrees now. Um, although I have been sitting here for a little, little while um, and I think some of the heat from the engine and so on is causing it to jump up um, because when I got here it was 27 just you know three or four minutes ago um, so it's probably about 27 outside but still that's a bit warmer than the, uh, the X3 I think it was about 23 or 24. In saying that I do have less fuel in the car um, so you could argue it's a tiny bit lighter um, but yeah as, as usual, our performance times aren't about trying to find the absolute quickest time possible for any given car. Um, it's more of just a guide and a real world time of what you, anybody can expect. So if you're buying this car, you can expect to get a similar time. Um, the official claims that manufacturers have, uh, they're probably or often likely in uh, very controlled conditions. There might only be five liters of fuel in the back of the, uh, in the fuel tank to, to save weight. Um, there's all these different variables. Um, but uh, yeah, our times are about uh, just real world and you can compare them. So they're, they're often tested in very similar conditions uh, by the same driver on the same uh, stretch of tarmac. Um, so you can compare the different uh, models in the same segment and so on. Anyway, let's see how it goes. I've got the uh, V-Box clipped on there and I've got the car all programmed in uh, from the other day. Um, and I've got it in dynamic mode with the stability control off. Uh, there's no launch control in this car. Um, not that there really is in the M X3 either. Uh, it's just basically brake loading or building the engine revs up on the gearbox. So the gearbox is engaged, there's a torque converter, um, and then you're using the brake pedal to release all the power. Um, whereas in my opinion, a proper launch control system is only with a dual clutch automatic or a single clutch uh, sequential automatic uh, where you can actually separate the gearbox and the engine and build the engine revs right up like a manual and then engage the gearbox uh, for a proper launch. Um, but we'll try out both methods in this car because sometimes I find that Jaguars, uh, supercharged Jaguars, you just nail the throttle and you get uh, a better, better performance, better time, uh, but only fractionally anyway. But we'll try out both methods. So that's ready to go. Um, we'll put it across into S mode and uh, I'll build up the engine revs and then uh, do a normal non-brake uh, loading start. 2000 RPM. So 4.58 seconds, that is slower than what we got the other day uh, from memory. It was about 22 degrees when we tested it the other day. Um, so obviously the cooler conditions help out a bit, uh, but we'll try just nailing the throttle. 
Actually, I'll do another run uh, other than this next one here, and I'll take off in first gear manually, because some Jaguar Land Rover cars, they like to take off in second gear automatic, uh, when you have it in automatic, I mean. Um, in my opinion, that's not really my problem or your problem as a driver. If Jaguar has engineered the car to take off in second gear, even in S mode and even in dynamic uh, mode for the, uh, for the powertrain, then that's the way it's gonna be. You know, that's the way they say that that's where you're gonna get the most performance. Um, but I'll try it out in manual anyway. Hit go, flick it across to S, and I'll just nail the throttle. Four point six four that time. Um, I'll do one more run in manual mode and we'll take off in first gear. Okay, so start, flick it across to S, and I'll click down, so that's definitely in first gear, um, and I'll just nail the throttle. Have a closer look, 4.50. We did do uh, 4.37 seconds the other day in cooler conditions. Um, I won't show you the time because it'll reveal the quarter mile and everything. I'd rather save that for the, uh, for the 0 to 100 video that we'll do for the cars. Um, but yeah, 4.37 was the best I got at 22 degrees uh, Celsius. So there you have it. Uh, I don't know why there's a bit of a difference there. Uh, I can only assume that BMW may be lying about its figures or it tests its engine figures uh, differently as in the, the engine output because this does have 30 more kilowatts of power uh, compared with the X3 and as you saw the weight is pretty much exactly the same. Um, the only difference I would say that might be causing the, the difference in acceleration is uh, discounting the temperature because as I said we've done the uh, 4.37 in cooler conditions so that's probably the best you're going to get. Um, but the other thing is the, the transmission. The transmission calibration is very different to the, uh, to the X3's transmission calibration. Even though it is pretty much the same gearbox, ZF gearbox, uh, that they both share, uh, they do have different calibrations. But anyway, low four seconds from a mid-size SUV is pretty awesome in my, uh, my opinion. Um, let's see how they go out on the road. Okay, we'll start out in the Jag, uh, but just keep in mind, I've driven both of them now for a little bit and I can sort of compare them both uh, as we're going along. The Jag to me is definitely the more luxurious car. It's, uh, it's got that more typical luxurious trait to it. Um, it's a little bit more comfortable, although the, both of the ride qualities are very firm. Um, but that's just, you know, the laws of physics dictate that a uh, tall and heavy car, um, you know, it's going to have body roll and so on. So to counter that, both companies have had to employ stiff suspension to try and, you know, minimize the body, you know, maximize the body control around the corners. And as a result, you've just got firm suspension. That's just the way it is. To me, it's the initial uh, initial bumps that you feel the most. Just the little ones, like bridge connections and some of these little corrugations and so on. Um, in both cars, that is. But when you start to push it pretty hard around the bends and you know start to hit some some bumps while you're mid corner, everything stays under control, and that's what you want. You don't want it to be bouncing all over the place um, because it is a very they, you know they're both very fast cars. Speaking of which, let's uh, give it a bit of a go. We'll put it into dynamic mode. Flick it over into manual. You just got the exhaust barking away. This thing is a troublemaker. That's what it is. It reminds me of that sort of bad boy at school who was always getting up to mischief, but the, you know, the teachers kind of like him. He's a bit cheeky, gets away with a few things. That's what this car uh, reminds me of. It's just a, it's a troublemaker. Listen to it.
It's insane. It's it's really cool car. It makes you feel good when you're driving it too, which I guess is pretty important. Down here, I might wind down the windows a little bit just so you can hear the engine a bit more bouncing off these rocks. It's definitely a crazy soundtrack. Full throttle. Bounce off the rev limiter there. Make sure no one's coming across the bridge at the same time. Yeah, listen to that. That's like snarly. It's it's um, very mischievous and sinister. Well, it's not even sinister actually. It's it's too loud to be sinister. It's you're very aware that uh, this is present. Bit of a tight hairpin up here. crazy sound I just can't get enough of that sound that's all I can sort of it's just totally consuming the drive the drive experience it's crazy um, I'm not sure about the window controls up there they're a bit of a stretch but I guess if you've owned it for a little bit you straight away get used to it very conventional for them to be down here that's where they are in pretty much every single car um, but yeah it's just I don't know, a bit unusual for me just to start with so keeping in mind I'm in a, on a country road right now and it's you know pretty coarse surface the ride's not too bad it's definitely firm like a sports car would be even if you you know didn't go for an SUV and went for a sports car that would still be quite firm as well um, but I think with these they've got more compression so the wheel does move up and does cap, catch uh, bigger bumps better than a uh, you know a, a hardcore sports car or the equivalent sort of sedan or coupe uh, with this sort of power and performance I'm not totally convinced on the transmission calibration that Jaguar has gone for with this car um, I, I seem to find that with a lot of JLR products uh, that it, I don't know it's it's hard to explain but especially when you're coming down to a uh, a slow corner like a roundabout or something like that you put your foot back on the accelerator not not driving you know sportily or anything like that just total conventional driving and you just touch the accelerator a little bit and there's this sort of delay where it doesn't really know what you want to do then you keep pushing it a bit more and then it gradually takes off and that's speaking about a 405 kilowatt v8 monster like this um, that is in the in the comfort mode I'm talking about by the way uh, if you put it in in the, in the dynamic mode it will change down gear but compared with the BMW that doesn't do that it, it seems to find the right or well, maybe the ratios are better spaced uh, for conventional driving because you go around a roundabout or whatever and it will be in the right gear already and just nice normal gradual acceleration um, whereas this has got that weird delay I've noticed it in a lot of uh, Range Rovers and Land Rovers um, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because, you know, the gearing has been set up to go off-road as well, to cater for off-road driving, uh, more so than, than the X3's uh, gear ratios. That could be the case, I don't actually know, but um, I just wish they would just work on that a little bit to make it a bit more, uh, what's the word, consistent when you're driving it in, uh, in normal conditions. Everywhere else though, uh, this I think is a lot more comfortable car. Um, the steering is pretty consistent, it's not too heavy or anything, um, and the suspension might be that tiny bit softer, but it, it's very close. At first I thought this was softer, um, because I, as I said, I picked this up before I picked up the X3, and I tipped it into some corners, and I, I automatically assumed, oh, this is a little bit soft, having not even driven the new X3 at that, at that point. Um, but now I'm jumping to and from either car they're, they're very similar again it's the smaller bumps that uh, that you notice the most it's these little surface changes and the little corrugations you can actually hear a bit of the trim shaking around um, it's only when you start to push it that the suspension starts to make a lot of sense um, because it can catch those bumps and keep composure keep the body composure going we'll go back to that 
dynamic mode. There's some corners down here. Even though it's only eight kilograms heavier, it does feel a bit heavier in my opinion. It's uh, the weight distribution feels a bit different. It feels a bit higher up in this. And I'm not as confident pushing it in the upper ranges. Um, just when you're driving like this, down a nice little spirited road, it's fine. But just when you're really pushing it around some bends, um, there's a bit of a sort of, not lack of communication, but you're sort of a bit vague on uh, what how the car's reacting. Whereas the X3, it seems to be a bit more precise. A bit more sound. So even now, it's just getting a little bit top heavy coming around the corner there. Um, I'm not going to say uneasy, but you know, it's just getting there where it's reminding you, hey mate, it's uh, I weigh 1900 kilos type thing. Whereas the X3 uh, doesn't have that same sort of sense. It still feels heavy, um, but just not as much. As I said, it's better as a luxury car because it's got that bit more of a show off factor. Um, and I mean that in a positive way. I don't mean, oh, you're a show-off. I mean that you can show it off and you feel good about it. Um, it makes you feel good. And, yeah, the drive experience feels a bit more luxury-oriented, even though it is, well, offers ballistic performance. Um, it does feel slightly skewed towards luxury, more so than the X3. Um, but both of them, yeah, both of them are definitely hardcore SUVs, hardcore performance SUVs, I mean. But this just feels a little bit more inclined towards luxury. And I think that's going to appeal to a wider range of, uh, of buyers. You know, because not all of us want to go to the track, you know, once a month and set a lap time. We want something that's fast and sounds really good, looks really sporty and looks good, um, but still acts as a normal SUV when you want it to. And that's what the F-Pace uh, SVR is all about, in my opinion. It's, uh, it brings in some of that SVO uh, inspiration and enthusiasm um, into a practical practical package but it's still got the Jaguar sports car DNA very much so um, especially in the design and the performance you can hear a few of the little rattles in the cabin here going along this rough road um, we'll check out the X3 in a minute I'll go through the same road and uh, we'll see the difference but yeah, I think if you're tossing out between these two, um, in terms of the drive experience, the Jaguar is for someone that definitely wants that V8 noise. But also wants to look very cool as they drive along. Um, the Jaguar is the winner in my opinion. In terms of in-cabin comfort and practicality, I think the X3 just nudges ahead. Um, I like the iDrive system better than the touchscreen. This touchscreen touch is okay. I mean, it's nothing bad. It's got plenty of apps in there. Um, but as I mentioned, you've got to reach across and, and look at what you're doing, um, which takes, takes your, your mind off the road. Um, same thing in the X3 as well with the hand controller, just not as much. Um, but also, this is a little bit dated. The color schemes and everything like that are a little bit, uh, a little bit dated now, in my opinion. Um, but it is good that they've got the climate control panel down here, so you can adjust that. You don't have to dive into the to menus of the touchscreen. Let's jump into the X3 now, anyway, and go through the same road and see how that goes. After we get a bit more of that sound, <laughs> back into sport mode or dynamic mode. Wait for this car to go past. 
I'll slow right down. It is a bit bumpy here, so we can watch the reaction to the steering. Oops, the red line for a second. Yeah, this engine's got a lot more theatre going on. Um, there's a lot more excitement with this engine compared with the X3, that's for sure. But yeah, let's jump into the X3 now and see how that goes. Just before we get stuck into the X3, I just want to go over some of the driving modes because there are an abundance of different settings that you can go through. Um, up here, you've got powertrain. Well, actually, it's not powertrain. Powertrain typically means engine and transmission, um, but you've got a separate setting for the transmission down here. So you've got engine, uh, suspension and steering and then a transmission setting just here you've also got an exhaust valve uh, button here as well uh, which the Jag did have that had a uh, adjustable exhaust um, uh, system as well for the engine you, it starts out with efficient whereas the Jag starts out with comfort and then I think there was an efficient mode below that I can't remember um, but whereas this is just starting out in efficient um, and at first it kind of upset me a little bit because when you get into the car, when you first get in and turn it on, it'll go into this setting. So efficient for the uh, engine, comfort and comfort for the, trans uh, for the steering and suspension. Um, this all sounds very complicated. Uh, it is a little bit, but uh, for, for the driving geeks out there and for the car geeks, they'll love this sort of stuff. If you're a bit old school, then you, you might not like it as much. Um, I'm usually pretty old school, I like the old, old school tech. I don't like some of the new technologies, such as the fake engine sounds coming through the speakers, which this car has, which is very disappointing. Um, but I, I do like this, having these different settings, because you can make the car feel how you want it to feel and change it for the conditions. Um, but anyway, at first the efficient engine was a bit, uh, it felt a bit sluggish, and I don't, didn't really like it. I th felt it was too soft uh, for this type of car. But then you can go through, uh, leave it in the, in the efficient for the engine, but you can go through and change the transmission up a peg and it will cha change down gears just a little bit earlier and behave pretty much like a, I don't know how to word it, but any other word than a normal car. It'll change down pretty quickly as soon as you hit the accelerator just a little bit, um, and, but it won't be too aggressive. Um, so, that, so it is good that you can change the transmission separately uh, to the engine. And then you can go through to sport and that, automatically uh, the throttle response becomes more sensitive so you only need to touch the throttle a little bit to get a reaction from the engine and you can go through and change the suspension to sport the steering to sport as well um, and then you've got another level of sport plus for everything then you've got these two buttons here m1 and m2 so what they are is i'll just put it back into park make sure the handbrake's on um, you go into the the media system here and you go to m setup and you can configure these buttons to mix and match all the different settings that you like. So you just basically hit them instead of going toggling through all these different separate settings. Um, so M1, hit confirm, you just tap it twice. I've got it set up for Sport Plus engine, Sport Plus suspension, comfort steering, and then the stability control in a sort of sports setting. Um, it's not completely off, it's just in sort of sport mode. We can go in and have a look at that. MDM it's called, Restricted Driving Stabilization, um, and then all the driving assistance uh, features are turned off, like the steering assistance if you go out of the lanes or whatever, that's all deactivated, but the uh, traction control is just, just weakened off a little bit, so allow a little bit of slip. But yeah, you can program these two buttons into whatever you want, um, which is kind of cool. As I said, having the uh, engine in efficient mode, it's a bit too soft for me, but then you can go through and put the transmission up, a, uh, up one setting, um, and that's how I'd have it all the time. But I guess the next step is, yeah, could you save that? And then when you get into the car, it saves all your settings. But I guess you're starting to play around with safety and things if you, if you do that, because you know your grandmother might get in the car and then you have it so the stability control is off as soon as you get in by default, um, which wouldn't be a good thing. We'll leave it in my preferred sort of normal setting to start with. Um, although there are a couple of bends coming up as we went through here in the Jag just before. 
but yeah, see, it, it takes the revs up a little bit, not too high, um, but then you only need to push the accelerator a little bit and it'll change back down again. It's not being too soft and see, it will hold the revs out a little bit too. The Jag, it felt like the comfort mode was just the efficient mode and it, um, sorry, that sun's kind of right in your face there. Hopefully it's not flaring up the camera lens too much. Um, but yeah, in the Jag, it kind of feels like the comfort mode is a bit too soft and then the transmission doesn't change down gears uh, early enough. Straight away, the seats in the, the X3 are actually softer than those in the Jag. I, th I thought it would be the other way around. I thought the Jag would have nice soft seats. But um, yeah, these are they definitely got softer cushioning. So we'll put it into that M mode while these S-Bends are up here. Yeah, so the X3 does feel a bit more together, a bit more precise um, when you're doing sort of heated driving. As you can probably hear, it doesn't sound anywhere near as exciting as the Jag. Uh, it does have a nice sort of sweet inline six roar to it, but I was hoping for a bit more of a scream. Um, I think because, actually we'll go around these corners and then we can talk. So yeah, it does feel a bit more agile. Um, yeah, I think this engine, it does have to live on for probably quite a bit. Um, so it's probably choked up with some emissions gear, uh, which stops it from being as loud as it could be. There's always the M performance catalog that you can go through and put a uh, sports exhaust option or even head to an aftermarket uh, exhaust specialist and get something much louder. Both cars have pretty stiff suspension um, and, and it's that initial bump that you'll probably notice the most but having driven this for a little bit longer now I think uh, they're both pretty even when you hit little bumps but then when you start to hit bigger bumps the X3 is sort of quicker to react in that it will catch the bumps quicker um, but that means it's less comfortable whereas the Jag catches the bumps more slowly um, and it improves comfort. That does mean the X3 is a bit more agile though, um, because you get better precise from the steering um, and body reaction as well. So you straight away, as soon as you turn in, everything will, will react almost immediately as you steer in. Whereas the Jag, you've got a tiny bit of a delay as the suspension soaks up various bits and pieces of bumps um, and, then, and then stabilizes the car. It's just a typical trade-off that you get. So you either have hard suspension, but you have better handling, less comfort, or you have softer suspension, but the handling isn't quite as good, um, but better comfort. There's some good bumps through here, so we can test that out. I do have it in Sport Plus. You can definitely feel those little bumps juddering through the whole chassis and through into the cabin. Some of the trim is rattling. It is a, yeah, it's a nice screaming inline six, but just not as uh, as loud as I was hoping. I'll turn the suspension down one, and we can just see what it's like. So put it into sport. They so still get all the performance from the engine and, and the response from the engine, and that has helped quite a bit actually. It's not. You don't get those, dsh, dsh, those, those little bumps don't make that sort of vibration through the cabin as much. Bridge connection, just fine. Didn't really, yeah, that's fine. That's totally fine in my opinion. Uh, for a sports car anyway, for a sports SUV. And this isn't really a sports SUV. It's sort of a hardcore performance SUV. It's not like the... Um, the X3 M40i, that's you know just an M performance car, whereas this is a proper M 
and model. I think it's uh, it's very acceptable. If you had any softer, it just wouldn't handle as well. So it's as simple as that, really. Nice bumps through here. Not too bad. There are some trim rattles, as I said. I don't know if it's quite at the level of the Jag. It's pretty even, really. I'd have to go through and watch it, and rewind it, and have, <laughs> have another listen. But yeah, there's a bit of a trim rattle from the... Uh, the door there and then something up here is rattling as well just very faintly but if that really bothers you you can put it into comfort mode for the suspension and it's still quite taut um, but yeah see how it just catches those bumps it's like a uh, I like to call it rubbery in in the sense that it's like you know hitting a tire with a baseball bat it's, it's very it's quite firm but if you hit it hard enough it'll catch the bump um, and not, you know, just collapse. It'll, it's very reactive in that sense. Very responsive, sorry. Yeah, I think the comfort mode is probably going to suit most people, even if you're doing sporty driving. It's not that bad at all. And some of those little trim rattles and things have quietened down a little bit. You can actually modify the, uh, the different settings in the Jag as well. If you go into the eye performance menu I think it was called um, and you can change the uh, suspension into comfort while you're still in dynamic mode so you do have that adjustment um, it's just not as you know they don't make it as obviously presented as they do in this with all the different settings up there and all your little buttons down here as well um, and again that in that sense the, the Jag is just a bit more luxurious it's more of a uh, luxury car in that, yeah, it'll do the performance stuff if you want it to, but it's not trying to make a big deal about that. It's it's more about a sort of refined driving experience. Whereas this is definitely more focused towards the drivers out there who, you know, might take it to a track a few times a year, um, but definitely go out into the mountains and uh, attack some twisty bends quite regularly. I'm glad that BMW M has gone with a conventional torque converter automatic for the, for the X3M. Um, because it is a lot smoother and I think a dual clutch auto might start to retract or t detract from the, an SUV's typical practicality. It might be stepping that too far towards being trying to be a sports car. Um, but in saying that, I think, I, well, I hope that they keep a dual clutch transmission for the next generation the M3. I know it's a bit um, immature of me to say this, but I like the M3 with the dual clutch transmission because you can come out of a corner and say you're in first or second gear even with the stability control completely turned off and under power you can click the next gear so second or third gear and it just fries the tires up the road it's it's awesome fun um, if you're on a track obviously uh, you can just drift until your heart's content and I, I love that that direct punching gearbox that just selects the gear straight away whereas I don't know if you could do that if it was just a normal torque converter automatic. It just, it's just not sharp enough to, to kick the back wheels or kick the traction um, so you can drift it like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know what they're going to have with the new M3. The M5 has a 8-speed auto just like this one. Um, torque converter auto, it's gone from a uh, dual clutch auto in the previous M5. So I don't know. But the M5, maybe it's a bit more luxurious focus compared with the M3. It's always been a bit more of a track car, the M3. Um, we'll just have to see. Good strong torque, good mid-range. Uh, 600 newton meters is quite impressive for a three liter engine. The Jag with its five liter engine has 680 newton meters, so it's only a little bit more. Um, very highly strung engine, this, this new, M, this new uh, S58. But they've, they've done really well. Looking forward to it in the new M3, that's for sure. Here's this straight bit up here. We'll slow right down and give it some gas again. And we'll hit these bumps as well. Go to the floor. Pretty amazing.
amazing acceleration. It actually feels like it's got better top end than the, than the V8 Jag. I know that's pretty unusual considering the power difference. There's 30 kilowatt power difference. But it actually feels like this has better top end. It just wants to keep screaming and the gear ratio is just burr, burr. if you notice just then it went into third uh, sorry from fourth to fifth i think it was and it was just a short change it was like a really quick shift in terms of the ratio um, it just keeps on soaring on definitely an awesome powertrain overall i think this is a uh, good first crack at a hardcore m model suv uh mid-size suv sorry um the only disappointments for me are the engine sound is not quite loud enough. I was hoping for a bit more in that department. I don't like the fake sound coming through the speakers. That's that's quite off-putting to me. Um, a lot of people probably won't even notice it, but I can definitely hear the speakers uh, making some noise as you rev up through the gears. But other than that, this is yeah, it's an awesome, awesome car. As I've mentioned, I do have an X3, so for the me, this is kind of like a dream car. I want an M3 but my wife wants a, uh, an SUV, so this would have to be the perfect compromise uh, for, for my scenario. Anyway, let's flip back to where we started and we'll wrap it up. So there you have it guys, the brand new BMW X3 M and the brand new Jaguar F-Pace SVR. I think they're, they're both very cool cars and it's good that uh, the manufacturers offer these because we all want SUVs, even though we say we don't. They, the stats show it that everyone's buying SUVs. So if we're going to do that, I mean, if we're going to go towards these cars, at least the manufacturers are offering us something exciting. They obviously aren't as sporty as a sports car or, an, or a sedan, sports sedan, um, but they come very, very close, uh, particularly the, uh, the X3 in terms of its acceleration and handling capability. Which one would I pick? Well, the F-Pace is definitely the, the coolest car. Like, it sounds awesome, it looks really sexy. Um, it's got a bit better options and things you can go through and make it more exclusive. Um, and it's, it's got that wow factor. Whereas the X3, you don't really notice it in traffic. It doesn't really stand out uh, unless you know your BMWs. Um, so yeah, the, the, the F-Pace is definitely cooler in my opinion. It's also $20,000 cheaper, I will not say cheaper, but less expensive than the, uh, the X3, which should come into your equation if you're tossing up between these two cars. For me, I'd take the X3 because it is more of a driver's car. It's a bit more hardcore, um, but out on the road, it's a bit more subtle. It doesn't stand out. It doesn't say, look at me as much, um, but it is a little bit quicker as we've found out. The ride quality is pretty similar in both of them. There is a compromise you have to make because um, they're not as comfortable as their regular counterparts. Um, but yeah, for me, I like the X3 better, but I can understand why anyone would want to go with the F-Pace instead. It definitely looks way better, stands out, it's got the V8 engine, um, and it sounds a lot better than the, the X3 as well, um, and it is a bit cheaper. So there you go. We won't be putting together a comparison, a written comparison on the website. I'll just be doing a written review for each of them, but we will do a separate 0-100 video for both of them in our usual format. Until then, thanks for watching.